Hi there, and welcome to the Hub of Junior Golf Podcast. I'm Ryan Burr, joined as always by the founder of the Junior Golf Hub, Roger Nick, and a very, very special guest this week, a Christmas treat, if you will, as we welcome in the very first head coach of the U.S. Development National Team, Chris Zambri. Coach, thanks so much for joining us. I know that uh, the holidays are tough for everyone, but uh, thanks for making time. Of course. Thank you for having me. I look forward to this hour. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how this happened. Obviously, a, a wonderful college head coaching career at both the University of South Carolina, excuse me, University of Southern California, and the other, then, the other way, yeah, USC, the yeah. other <laughs> USC, and then yeah. of course uh, moving as the associate head coach at Pepperdine, both places on the West Coast, incredible success. But then, uh, you know, named the head coach of the developmental team. How did it come to be? Well, I, I heard about this program um, through the grapevine, like probably a, a lot of people, and it sounded really interesting to me. Um, and so I, um, I actually was, Scott Langley reached out and I reached out to a number of coaches, I think, and tried to get um, some feedback on, on people who have coached golfers who were part of federations. And so I was on his list to reach out and, um, and uh, he he called me, but I made sure before we said word one that I let him know that I was super interested in in uh, what they were doing. And um, so we talked for a while and I said, you know, when the time comes, uh, will you let me know when there's a job opening? And um, and so they opened a job up for the, uh, the person in charge of development. And I thought that sounded like something I was interested in. And as it turned out. I probably wasn't qualified for that job. So luckily um, they made a wise decision and, and hired a woman named Dr. Beth Brown. But then the coaching job opened up and I um, submitted a resume for that and went through the interview process and was lucky enough um, to get the job. So really exciting uh, opportunity of a lifetime for, for me. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to trying to make a difference. You know, it's, it's going to be interesting. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a tall task. Um, we got a lot of people in this country and a lot of them are really good at golf. And so some people find themselves asking, you know, what's the point, you know, we've already, we're doing a pretty good job already. You know, um, our, our men and women golfers are great. They're on television every week. And, and um, I can, I can see that point, but on the flip side, you know, our golfers are kind of out there on their own, you know, they, they really are completely on their own. I mean, they, they have instructors, but even coming to an instructor is, is a decision that's usually not made um, with any advice. Right. And so they ask around, they talk to other parents and that's kind of where they get their information. And then they go to college and then hopefully they go somewhere where they're going to get a lot of help because uh, the college system is great. But um so many other countries have a system in place that really look after their young talent. And so that's what uh, the, the USGA decided they wanted to do was put together a program where we could help um, kind of shepherd our players from maybe being a great 14 year old to all the, all the way to being a great pro. Yeah, Chris, you've had some great success, obviously developing players at the schools that you've been and this is, uh, as you said, a very daunting task because it, it hasn't been done before in the U.S. So uh, looking at that, what do you think, you know, thinking about the future of the game for the, especially the women's game, you know, how do you think this is going to actually materialize or transform uh, the women's game uh, in the future? Oh, great question. I mean, I hope we, we, we help both sides, both the men and the women, um, but Hopefully, you know, it, it's interesting when I got this job um, and when I, you know, I, I interviewed for the job, but when I got the job, it hit me, you know, this is kind of a big deal. And um, how am I going to navigate this and, and, um, you know, make the right decisions that actually make a difference. And so I went through a lot of soul searching there and trying to figure out, you know, all the safe things that I could introduce and then it finally dawned on me, I, I got to go to a, a training camp for the Swedish team for about four days over Thanksgiving. And I mean, if you're going to help people get better at golf, I don't think there's a real safe way. You've got to do something. And and so um, 
what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to be tinkering with golf swings, but I'm certainly going to be giving feedback on whether they function well enough to play high level golf. And so um, what I kind of, you know, what I came to, to understand or to know, at least for now is, you know, the things that I did as a college coach or what I need to do in this position, I need to, um, you know, there golf's so many things, but there's, there's some that are more most critical, you know, and I could go through the list, but there's probably 10 of them. And, and when I was at USC, we developed a system to kind of measure these things and it works. It, it worked for us. Like we help people get better. We, we put out good teams. I mean, it's interesting to try and figure out in golf, like, well, how do you know it worked? Well, I know the test scores got better and I, and I know that there was a real correlation between certain tests and becoming an All-American or being good enough to turn professional. And so um, I feel confident enough in that system to bring it to what I'm doing now. And, and like I said, there was a, a while there where I was really uncertain as to, gosh, how can I, you know, it, it's hard to navigate these waters because you have a, a player and then you have his coach or her coach, and then you have the college coach, and then then there'll be us, the development program. And so how do you navigate that? And and like, to me, the way to navigate it is going to be by doing the things I did when I coached in college, which is doing a lot of measuring, a lot of feedback, and just pushing kids. You know, maybe it's, you get a kid and you say, hey, you know, all my data shows that you don't quite get it online as well as you need to, to play this game at the highest level. And the good news is you do so many other things well, and that's how you got to be in this program because you obviously shoot pretty good scores. But if you can, if you could somehow figure out how to hit it online better, um, I know you'll shoot lower because it's a big factor in golf. And so then the next question is, well, how do we fit into that? And I'm not sure how we fit in, but I know we can at least give that feedback and say, hey, you know, go back to your instructor and, and get, let's talk, you know, at, let me put it a, be, a better way. I'm going to probably be in touch with the instructors because unlike college golf, there's no rules against collaborating with any other coaches. And so we'll be together collaborating as a group and I'll be able to say, you know, here's Here's where he or she stands in, in the continuum of scores that I've seen over the years. There's room for growth here. Um, golf's hard. I'm not sure how to get there always, but I can at least say keep searching, you know, because that's actually some decent advice that um, that I feel comfortable giving because of just the data that I've accrued and in, in understanding what good looks like and what needs help. Coach, I'm overwhelmed for you. Um, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, I just, I don't see, uh, I, I don't see how the number of players is so overwhelming in the men's and women's side. How early of an age do you start? Because I'll tell you right now, there's 15 parents watching this podcast, 15 that believe that their son or daughter is the very best player in the country and tell right. people that oh, my son's ranked <laughs> as number one player yeah. in the country. Right. Um, and and that's that's wonderful. But, you know, there you know, I look at it. You you bring up the college thing. You have maybe 10, 12 players on your team. It's real easy to work with 10 or 12 players and make them better. You know, I think Canada has been fantastic with the national team. They can identify their 10 best players because everyone else is playing hockey. I just I'm that's just a good so, point. <laughs> I'm so overwhelmed for you with the mass of a players and how early are you going to start this? We're, well, when I was interviewing for this position, we thought we were going to, as a group, be looking at like 12 year olds to 24 year olds. So, so we were going to take junior golfers, high level amateurs, and then young professionals. And, and that's kind of similar to what Canada does and, and kind of similar to what Sweden does. And we were going to, they were going to be part of this program. And um, we decided that 12 was a little young. Um, 
I actually was interviewed and I brought a little study with me because it was one of the questions they had was what would you do differently? And I, I, I brought a little study um, with the, the junior world winners at age 12 on girls and boys side in a 10 year span from like uh, 2012 back to like, uh, or 2011 back to like 2002. And, and I brought the winners from the, um, the uh, US kids championships on both sides. And there was 38 winners because one of the years I couldn't get on the US kids, but so 38 winners. And um, I think there were like three or four total players who had had a top 10 on either the PGA or LPGA tour out of that group. And, and there was two winners, there was Lilia Vu and um, Grayson Murray. And other than that, there wasn't a lot of correlation between 12 and, and professional. And so um, that was my, my two cents. And I was hoping not to ruffle any feathers with it. Um, but, but there was other people um, involved in the program that had similar thoughts. And so we decided to bump it up to 13. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's daunting and, and, and it has cost me a few minutes or hours of sleep in the last couple months, but, but I'm starting to get a feel for how this can work. And um, a lot of it's going to have to, to, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the stuff that I've done in the past, it wasn't super tech driven, but there was some tech involved. We had, we needed a, a way to test people which involves tech sometimes. And we also needed a place to put the data. And so the way we're seeing it now is hopefully, you know, I'll give you our immediate future. We're gonna name 10 kids to the uh, eight to 10 girls and eight to 10 boys in the next two months to the US national team, okay? And, you know, how are we coming to those conclusions? We're, we're coming to them, you know, in various ways. I've always been a huge believer in rankings. Um, I know that rankings aren't perfect, but I can tell you as a, as a division one college coach, I looked at the rankings every week. You know, I, I don't know if it was every day, but I looked at them a lot. And um, as it turns out, they're pretty accurate. You know, they, uh, there's, there's some places out there that do rankings and they're fairly accurate. It certainly would be the place I start, right? And and I mean, clearly, every once in a while, you see something in a ranking that doesn't seem quite right. You might see very limited scores, which can be a little scary if you're trying to judge somebody's abilities. But but the rankings are pretty accurate, and there's there's enough of them out there to to put together a study and kind of come to conclusions on who are the best players. And so we've used a lot of that to to start narrowing down our list. We've We've talked to a lot of manufacturers whose job it is to identify players also, and they've been really helpful and forthcoming with who's on their short list. And so um, we're hoping that, like I said, name this team before the end of February. And then that'll be where we start. We'll start with 16 to 20 athletes, and then the real work begins. And how do we make an impact on them becoming better golfers? You know, like we, I don't want us to just be in a place where they get to go and compete, which would be cool and, and would be helpful. Um, but if we're really going to have an impact, we're going to have to do more than, you know, be travel agents and take them to competitions. We're going to have to teach them things about golf that are important that that most pros know and, and a lot of young people don't yet. And so that's our goal is to get them better. Roger, I see your hair. I see your hair on fire. So go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, I was uh, very fascinating uh, talking about this and talking about rankings as a place to start. Um, Chris, one of the things that uh, I know Ryan and I and Noda and, and many of us in the in the junior golf space, you know, I'll talk about this a lot. Which is what happens to the kid? Obviously, you let me let me go back a second here and say you have such a big audience that you're going to have to pull from at some point in time, right? So as we're talking about this at 13 to 24 is a huge span, right? So where are those players if they're, let's say you got grassroots players out there, players who haven't played in events or enough events to get ranked, get noticed, get identified, if you will. Um, and I think because we're such a, an expansive country, uh, unlike some other smaller countries that you know, their players, you know where they all are. We just have such a massive web of players out there. 
what do you think is going to be the way that, you know, really kind of talking about for a parent or kid here, how do they get recognized if they're not playing, you know, these AJG events ranked or, you know, getting on junior golf school board ranking right away at 13, 14, 15, because obviously that is a, the, the launching pad most likely for you guys to start. You want to get them in the pipeline as early as possible uh, for this development to really make the impact down the road that I think uh, the USGA is hoping to make. And I'm sure you are as well as a coach uh, because I know you have to have success early. So I, I'm sure rankings are going to help that to your point of identifying players immediately. But beyond that, what's the next steps? Where, how are you going to find those players that are just not able to be out there and play in enough events to get ranked? Yeah, traveling, you know, state to state. And yeah. So, so we've also piloted a, a state program. And so we have seven states who are part of our pilot program and they're putting together a statewide team. And so um, eventually we'll have, Ideally, we'll have every state with a state team, and we're we're um, they're putting together um, a, a committee to help name their players. And so, I understand. You know, I I, I coached here in California. Um, you could you could pretty much not leave the state and put together a, a you know the best college team, which I've seen it happen, you know, with teams like Cal and in, in around 2011, 12. And we had a team in 15 and 16 that were all kids from, from in state. And so I understand that there are some kids out there who won't be traveling all over the country who are still great, but some, somebody's going to know about it. You know, and and so like the USJ has these great relationships with what they call allied golf associations. And I always use an example here where I live. We have the Southern California Golf Association and, and I know they have the Northern California Golf Association. And so um, we, we have enough partners to be able to find out about these players who are really, really good, but haven't really made a splash on a national scene. Um, in the end, we're, we're going to have more than 10 players from the boys and 10 from the girls. But for now, we're naming 10. Eventually, our goal is to have 30 boys and 30 girls, um, 20, let's see, 60, 15 high-level amateurs on the women's side, 15 high-level amateurs on the men's side. And then I've heard anywhere from 10 to 20 pros on each side. Um, and so we're definitely going to be a bigger team than just eight or 10. And, and ideally we have, you know, we'll, we'll get the kind of information necessary to identify the players who you won't normally see, especially on the, some of the rankings are, are, uh, they're not all the same. I know the AJGA ranking is different than the junior golf scoreboard ranking. And, and there's, there's quite a bit of fluctuation in, in where people are ranked in each of those. Um, but I think I'm fairly confident we're going to do a good job of, of getting these first eight to 10 in, in what's to say, who's to say what's right, because in the end, it comes down to uh, a informed um, choice, right? There's no absolute rankings, you know, between how good golfers are. But, but like I said, using the rankings, using the information we're getting from manufacturers whose job it is to identify these great young players. I mean, that's just what they do for a living basically um, other than sell clubs and make lots of money, but, but their job, you know, in some of their departments is to identify great young players. And so um, I feel confident that we'll, we'll get together a list that's, that's really strong. And, and there's a really good chance that we'll miss out on some people because we just haven't heard of them yet. Although, somebody's heard of them you know somebody in the state has heard of these players and and um you know that's another one of our goals is to help foster along kids who who aren't necessarily in a position to spend a ton of money and travel all over the country we started a grant program recently um kids are applying for grants and and based on how much need they have and then how well they play golf we'll be able to supply them with grants that will help pay for instruction travel equipment uh 
um, places to access practice facilities. And so, um, you know, one thing I will say, we, we're very new. We just started. Um, we, we're, we're trying to, we've done a lot of research and, and, and asked a lot of questions, but we're still just starting. And so we know that we're, along the way that we might make some mistakes, but, but right now we're, we're doing our best to, like I said, our, our, our starting point would be to name these eight to 10 kids. All right. Hey, Chris, one, one question I want, sorry, Ryan, I, I just said uh, one quick question too, is let's make it very clear of what, what the goal of the uh, program is all about. And I think one of the yeah. misnomers out there is, is what the, the USGA is doing here. It's to win championships. Let's, let's face it. It's not to just send kids to college or whatever. This isn't about no. that. This is about building. No, our goal is to help American golfers compete at the highest level of professional golf better. Right. And so our goal is the way I look at it and the way that when I talk to the people I work with, like our director, Heather Daly, Dona Frio, and Dr. Beth Brown, we're trying to help young players avoid some of the pitfalls that come with this road from starting golf to getting better. I mean, we're a very unique sport. Like, if you catch a 13-year-old who can, you know, and who knows, I might be out of my element with this analogy, but if you catch a 13 year old who can run an 11 flat 100 meter and you can kind of predict their development as far as just physically, you can predict that that's, that time will, will get lower as they get a little older. And golf's this weird sport where you could be a zero at 14 and a plus two at 15 and then a two at 16, you know, because golf's just so difficult and, and it's so confusing for young people and even old people to try and improve at. And so our goal is to help when, when someone has kind of made it through the initial gauntlet of just becoming a good player, or let's say a zero is to help keep them on track. And it might not be things that we teach them, but ways that we point them, right? We might say, Hey, you live in this area of the country. There's a short game instructor down there that you should go see. Um, because we want our biggest talents to not fall to the wayside, right? And we want to, it's not, it's actually not just about them either, because we think that, I think that if, if this state program takes off the way we want it to, a lot of the things that I believe in, and I know you believe in, Roger, about, about training and about off-course data collection and, and, and skill development and, and skill measurement, I think some of that could spread in a much bigger fashion. And, and, you know, one of the things I've always, as a college coach, I used to always, I would get kids in the program and, and, you know, inevitably everybody had an instructor. And so you would always have these occasions when a, a kid would go get some help for their instructor. And, and I would be sitting there going, gosh, everything this person's doing T the green is, this is about as high level as I've ever seen. So I wonder what they're working on, you know, and, and, and I'm praying it's <laughs> going to keep things the way they I are. I want to go backwards. <laughs> right, right. And so, so my, my thoughts were always, well, how does the instructor know that something you have is broken because you tell them it's broken because all the data I say, all the data I have accrued in the last month and a half says everything you're doing is about the highest level we've ever measured. So, what are we changing here? And and so my hope is that maybe this style or this approach will will spread maybe through the state programs and stuff where where before we start changing things, we'll first figure out for sure at what level they function, you know, and if you can create some benchmarks and if people meet the benchmarks, then at that point, I would think you need to stand back um, before you start fiddling because. Um, I always like to say it's hard enough to get great at golf once, you know, let alone <laughs> twice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's all about the long-term athletic development model. Right. I mean, if you really think about it from that perspective, I know Ryan, how many uh, weeks now, uh, I mean, years we've spoken about, you know, the, the development model, if you will, from the physical, the mental, you know, and, and obviously golf skills. So to your point, Chris, I think it is so hard 
to you see a player who at one point is a zero at 12 but then turns into a, a five at you know 16 right it's I mean, brutal, brutal. <laughs> it's, you know what what are they actually doing from a development standpoint of physical development mental development and all of those are skills to be developed right and i think we kind of miss mistake scores for development you know and i, I think that's what it sounds as though you guys are trying to implement and do, which is fantastic. Uh, it's something I know Ryan and I, it's near and dear to our heart with uh, player development index and the assessment part. So things that Chris, you and I talked about, right? I yeah. mean, it's still, yeah. uh, something we're on the same page about. So Ryan, I'll let you, I know you're, you're kicking in there. So on the men's side, I'm looking at the official world golf rankings and 16 of the top 25 in the world are American. Sure. So, I mean, I, I, I'd have a tough, I'd have a tough time someone telling me that you know that needs to be improved. I mean, 16 of the top 25 are American, and the more you go down, the more, the more dominant Americans are. The further you, you know, from from 50 to 100, it's even more dominant towards the American side. Now, certainly, as you look at these names, you probably, to your point earlier, you probably can just go straight AJGA all American Rolex guys. And, and that's probably, uh, I mean, Xander Shoffley, he's one that, that was a late bloomer. Uh, you know, certainly I'm going down the list. I mean, all these guys were Keegan Bradley, certainly. And so Keegan's now up to 16 in the world, maybe even Kepka, who wasn't a dominant junior turned out obviously to be great players. The men, I think there's pretty, pretty, there's no way, to screw it up. I mean, there's just so many great <laughs> boys that are going to be great players and you have so many to pull from that you're going to get it right. As Roger and I look at the college teams for the girls, it is becoming more and more and more and more internationally dominant, which then you go to the same Rolex rankings for the girls, and certainly the Americans are represented, but we all understand that, you know, Korea had their dominant phase, and now Thailand is is pumping out fantastic players at an, a pretty unbelievable rate. So understanding that the boys, you, you're, you can only help the process. Money can only help things. And as I said, when you look at the top 100 players in the world and 60 to 65 percent of them are Americans, you're going to you're going to be fine there. Seeing that the women's game by the numbers is dropping against the world, um, how can you focus and what can you do, I think, is is what many of our listeners will, will want to know, is how you can bring that back and make the U.S. girls more competitive. It's a good question. Um, well, well, almost every place you brought up um, has an organized group behind it. Okay, so that's that's a we don't, you know, and so these organized groups work. You know, I, I, like I said, I spent four days with the Swedish team. They were amazing. They let us come, and 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 um, I, I came for. I was just standing around for four days watching them practice and checking out the things they did and and they did some cool and interesting stuff um but the one big point that i learned was that first of all sweden's about 10 million people um and and virtually nobody from the north makes it in golf it's people from the southern part of sweden so it's a really small area that they're producing a lot of really good players from especially compared to their size and so what I learned after just talking with the coaches who were there is that they pretty much are part of their development from the time they're 14 till about the time they're 23 or 24. Um, and so, so they have 20 high schools there that are, that have golf, 18 of them, they, they call state, I think they call them local or state. And then they have two that are called national. The, the kids at the locals are are seeing somebody about golf three days a week for two hours a day. The ones at the national are seeing people about golf 
five days a week for two hours a day. And the people they're seeing are trusted instructors, you know, at the national um, schools. These are the folks that that worked with uh, Ludwig and and tons of other great players who've ended up playing on Ryder Cups and Solheim Cups and and but even at the local schools, the 18 local, those are instructors that they've, I wouldn't use the word approved, but they're good instructors who work locally, who, who help these kids three days a week. And so just imagine having, you know, someone like Roger working with a group of players three days a week for five years is what happens in their high schools are five year long high schools. Like that's a lot of good help. And, and the reason they're good is because they're getting good help. And so um, right now in the States, we have some kids getting great help and some kids maybe not getting great help. Maybe they don't have instructors. Maybe their dad is their instructor and, 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 and dads for as much as they, they want to help and they love, love, love their children. And, and they know a fair amount about golf. They're not, they haven't devoted their life to knowing a lot about golf. And so I think that the way that we could make an impact on that side is by getting involved with these players at a younger age and, and teaching them how to practice a little bit differently, um, teaching them about what's important. Um, and, and, and like I, said earlier just kind of shepherding them through the process you know an example would be this a young person they're out there on their own they're there's somewhere between 13 and 18 they're in their say their sophomore year in high school they go play a tournament they take 32 putts in a round their their parents decide 32 putts is way too many even though they might have even gained against strokes gain but but 32 sounds like a lot. Um, it's not necessarily a lot. It might be great. It might be a phenomenal day of putting. The next thing you know, they've got a new putting instructor. They just take a stroke that absolutely gets it online and then decide to start over and basically ruin something. And, and I mean that in maybe a little bit of a melodramatic, I mean, to say they ruin it, but, but having a putting stroke that hits it online it's something to cherish, not to mess with. And and so there's just so many ways that things kind of, you know, a, a person's game can fall off the tracks. And so our hope is to just help them stay on the tracks, to be able to, to maybe, if that happened to be one of the 30 girls in our program, to say, hey, mom or dad, if, if, you, if, you, if you think you see something that you want to maybe do something about and you don't have a, a, an instructor that you heavily rely on or, or maybe they're expensive and you only see them once every three months, call us, you know, call me, run your problem, let us know what's going on. Maybe, maybe I will have all of her data and say, you know what, she's, I, I've got 37 rounds in the system here and it says she's losing 0.14 around putting that's pretty darn good for a 14 year old like the last thing she needs help with is her putting right now or the last thing that needs to change and so i just think i think we can make a difference on both both the girls and the boys side by just being involved and helping with these big decisions and then maybe on top of it teaching you know i would guess that we're getting outworked a bit by some of these younger players in, in other countries. And maybe we'll never work as hard as, as some of these countries and, and, and have our young players devote, you know, nine hours a day to, to getting better at golf. But, but, but maybe with getting them to work two hours a day, but working a lot smarter, um, we can get them ramped up to a point where we are back to our place of being the dominant country in women's golf. You know, I, I, I know it's a, it's a big task. We're, we're never going to, at least in, not in the foreseeable future, I don't see us housing these players. Um, they're not going to be at special high schools where they're gonna get instruction, but, but hopefully we can develop a program that, that um, touches them enough, uh, you know, in person, whether it be at a training, um, a, a training, session or maybe by going to some of their tournaments and and um doing some some work 
there, but also just pushing out information. Um, but you know, it's 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 not going to be easy. We're not we're not going to start a you know our, our new our new place is down in Pinehurst. We're not going to open a a giant dormitory and house 500 kids. Um, so it's a it's a big task. I understand, but but I think we can make some headway. Yeah, I mean that's it's, it's pretty incredible to listen to you uh, talk about it, Chris. Obviously, your passion uh, for what you're doing, which is uh, what we need. We need somebody waking up every day uh, and and focused on this, right? So that's uh, I know that's the point of the whole program. So that's that's amazing, and, and thanks for doing that uh, and taking on this role because it's it's a big one. Um, I think one of the things that would be great for our audience to hear is like if if I have a junior player. How do I get involved? What's the next steps? How what what can I do to understand? You know, do I have a chance to get into a program, or is this going to be led primarily through instructors or coaches that's going to be identified from the USGA? Uh, great question. So, um, a junior golfer can go onto the USGA website, um, and let me I'm going to get this right. So I'm going to to bring it up. Um, as we talk here, they go onto the USGA website. Uh, I want to get them to this. Oh, wait a second. US. Okay, you go to championships, and then when you so you 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 hover over championships, and this this big menu comes. Then if you go all the way down to the right, you'll see U.S. National Development Program, and in there. Um, you can see there's a, a US NDP grant application that's now open. And then if you go down to a, another tab called US NDP resources, um, you can find places where you can get in contact with us. Um, like I said, we're, we're taking grant applications now. And um, we also have kids sending us their resumes. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, let me get our. I, these are all things I should know, but um, um, I'm trying to. I think our our email is um, usndp at usga.org. So if they send an email to usndp at usga.org, we'll, we'll see it. Um, we'll be able to get back in contact with them. It's interesting it, it, thinking about just how. It's so it's such an interesting sport. Like, how do you? I mean, the good news is it's not. It, there are numbers, you know, that that are helpful. There's scores, there's finishes, there's rankings. Um, it would be. It, it, I can't imagine how hard this would be if we were like baseball and we were trying to identify pitchers. You know, you almost have to see them or at least have their, you know, their fastball measured to to. You know, because just a, a, I guess the record would be of, of note. Yeah, but I mean, um, the only, if I can interrupt, Coach, the only thing sure. I would say is the rankings and the the scores, and obviously that's that's important. I mean, if you can, if you're shooting five under par, you're a really good player, and you're going to be on a lot of people's radar to play collegiately. Sure. You know, obviously Roger has developed a system. To my knowledge, the only system that predicts performance in the future. Right. So, you know, the the ranking system, it's been around and it's used, and people do slip through the cracks because you can be a really good player that is shooting five under par that has peaked out physically, and then unfortunately, you have a great you know, great high school career, great junior career, college, maybe a little step down. And then you try to play professionally. It doesn't work out because physically not only are other people on you're on this path and someone else is on this path that you were beating by six shots as a 16 year old, but as a 19 year old, for whatever reason, they're now beating you. So what happened? No, I didn't stop working any harder. I'm still at the range. I still have my instructor. I'm still doing everything I can do to that, I think. But, you know, this guy that or girl that I was significantly better than, I, I can barely compete with them anymore. I want to know what they're eating and drinking. Um, how much will you try to use 
PDI or other predictive formulas that ultimately predict what one of those tracks you're on. Meaning, I mean, there are a lot of really good 13, 14 year olds that you just look at physically and they are shooting 64, 65 from that distance. And they are the best player in the country. You know, like, I mean, right. the parents will tell you and, and their rankings will tell you they're the best player, but they're also doing it by, you know, they're maybe getting out driven by 25 yards, but they're making that up and they're, and they're beating the people that are significantly out driving them. But at 16, 17, 18, at 6,500, 6,800, 7,200, 7,700, and that's unfortunate. That's where we're at. Seventy-seven. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden, that player that was, you know, playing other sports, so they're not traveling the world, playing the AJGA twelve months a year, building their great ranking up, building their ranking up. They're playing other sports. They're moving from basketball to football, and then when the snow melts, they move into golf, but you know what? Their, their swing speed is 127, but they just haven't put the time in yet. And then you see, okay, wait a second. You know, Tony Fee now, I, I'd like a piece of that. That that's I'd like to have some of that athleticism. Uh, <laughs> but it 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 kind of shows up late. Or will you guys try to get into the predictive formula of trying to maybe not just take the kids that have the highest ranking, but try to take the kids from Roger's system that eventually the entire country is going to be doing PDI. I'm sure of it, that that is going to be more of a predictive. Uh, I mean, I know you need both, right? I always tell people this, and I'm, I'm going on here. I always tell people this watching junior golf. There's three kinds of junior golfers. There's the junior golfer that's an unbelievable player that scores great, that just doesn't hit it far. And the odds of him making it are, are going to be difficult. Then there's the kid that hits it an absolute mile, but he has zero idea where it's going. And he's got good days, but for the most part, he's just wild. He's not going to make it either. Even though he has the physical tools, the odds of him making it are slim. And then there's that super, super small line of the kid that swings it and he scores and everything's on the map. And that's, I mean, you go down, that's Tiger, that's Phil, that's Jordan, that's JT, that's Rom, that's Rory. I mean, like those guys at 14 were the best because they've always kind of had both ends of the spectrum. And I just, PDI is the only thing I've ever seen that, ultimately also brings in potential into plan. I know potential is a scary word and it's super easy to just go by the rankings because those guys and gals are the best because the rankings tell you they're the best. I'm just wondering, you know, you're in a position now where you could look a little outside the box and, and, and watch people. I'm going to keep an eye on him. I'm going to keep an eye on her, the potential to be great. I know they're not there now, but that potential could be great. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I love what you're saying. Um, I, I feel like, you know, that some of the tests that I've developed are, are somewhat predictive also, um, that there's um, there's something magical about people who control the ball and, and it can be hard to figure out why, you know, it, Everybody's got so many people have not everybody. So many people have launch monitors and all these ways of measuring this, that, and the other. And you know, you think it's going to be about path, and then it's then you think it's going to be about contact, and then you think it's going to be about angle of attack, and then you think it's about spin lock or, or whatever. So, um, but in the end, some people do control it. And so, if if there's some things that I'm looking at that are along the lines of what Roger does, and not completely the same, but I'm going to be really interested in measuring their ability to control the ball. You know, I have a test and I bet Roger has one too, but it's, I have three actually that are, we, I call them line tests and it's just how well can you land it on your target line? And it turns out that the connection between doing well at that test and being good is, is very much entwined. Um, at least everything that I've seen from 2008 until now, 
with the players that I've coached, the strongest correlation between being great and, and struggling is your ability to get the ball online. And so, you know, I, you know, the, the one thing is these kids who are coming onto our teams, they're, these are not lifetime appointments. And so, so, and I don't know the, the mechanism by which they wouldn't be, but I just know that we're going to name kids to me that are our best bets right now. Um, I will always be conscious of, of athleticism and, and, and how much, you know, how hard a person hits a golf ball, because I know that that length is, is a huge part of being good at golf and um, their strokes, you know, length is strokes and their portions of strokes. And the longer you hit it, the easier golf is, you know, granted that you kind of get it online. And so, um, but, but the way that I'm, foresee doing this for now is is that you know we're going to have juniors and amateurs and then pros and they're not the juniors that we name now are not necessarily going to be with us when they're amateurs and with their when they're pros um you know everybody people are going to come on the scene there might be a bunch of people who come on the scene but but in the end like I, if there was ever a sport where predicting has been incredibly difficult especially when someone's not shooting the scores yet you know there's just it's very hard to say that a 74 shooter will ever be a 70 shooter um it, just so much can go wrong so much needs to go right um and so you know the way that i'm thinking about it now is i'm going to stick with the players that that play the best and Certainly with an eye to the future, my eye will be closely related to, I mean, there's going to be more things that are predictive than just, can you get it online and can you hit it hard? You know, working with our development, um, in a person, Beth Brown, you know, we hope to develop or, or start using other predictors of, of future greatness, which are probably not, well, certainly aren't all physical. And so ideally we'll get better at predicting, but it's just, um, from my position, I was a college golf coach, so I wasn't taking kids from 13 forward. I was getting them. I was trying to make decisions on how good they were at 14, 15, 16, and then hoping they would continue to get better and then show up and then hopefully help them get better. Um, so I think there's a lot we're going to learn. And, and it sounds like Roger's done a lot of work that is the kind of work that that will end up needing quite frankly we will need predictive measures on how to go from you know i always say it this way though and i still believe this that if you give me any grouping of ranking from 1 to 10 to 11 to 20 to 21 to 30 and you take it all the way out to a thousand my best bet is going to be on the grouping 1 to 10 you know at least for now um and and so doesn't mean that there might be a you know you, you, a lot of people will say well i bet i could get i'll come up with 10 players who can compete with them well you can but 10 out of the other thousand i'm i'm trying to start with a group um and so for now i i just i know what you're saying ryan and i i love it like if i just find it hard to predict in this game yeah I yeah. do. And, and well, so well, well, golf is a hard one because you can hit a great shot and a hit a sprinkle head and bounce out of bounds. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, there are so many other variables that go into it. And, and I think to your point, Chris, is, you know, to to really, truly predict the future is just incredibly hard. I think one of the things for us and I think what separates what we're doing from a from a predictive analysis is really more of the mental stuff and also the physical stuff. Golf skills, you know, kind of come along with that. You know, so but if you're actually able to develop a player's mental skills and their physical skills, it re really leads to skill acquisition. Right. So at the end of the yeah. day, that's why I think what we do and what we what we've been developing is so unique. And what it does is because it's not just about the golf skill stuff. Right. It's how you get to the golf skill stuff. And I think that's the, the fun part about it is it's it's almost unseen. Right. And and it takes a special player to actually go through it and commit to that and actually stay it with it. Right. It so does. I think that's really part of it as well. So that but it's fun. Things, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. But one of the things that I um 
I, I, I wrestled with a lot, especially when I started conducting practices in this manner, which was more data collection, 20 shot tests, um, a lot of yardage work, um, was that it was different. And, and I fought some mighty battles with a lot of young players. And luckily, right around 2015, I, I got just the right group, who, just the right leaders who, who bought in and then brought in young players who bought in. And, and probably because the older guys were, were positive about what was going on. And then next thing you know, we, we got on a really good roll um, and we had people who really believed in what we were doing. And, um, but there were times though, certainly when, you know, I mean, I had occasional meetings with parents saying, my son will not be doing this stuff anymore. <laughs> and so, and so um, it's not easy to do something differently than just dump a bucket and pound balls, you know? Yeah. yeah. Last, last thing coaching, we'll let you go. Obviously uh, the almighty dollar, uh, is a game changer in everything, uh, you know, to choose basketball, football, baseball, hockey, golf, tennis. Uh, so many people ultimately, you know, where can I make the most money? How can I get money? NIL, where's where's it at? Is there money available in golf now? Does this development team give me a chance for my son or daughter can, can bring money in? Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of different things about developmental teams financially. I know travel tournaments, teaching their their opportunities to to get assistance there. Is there going to be an actual? Uh, are are these development players going to be paid? Is that something that's been discussed? Is there? How is the financial model going to work? Um, there's right now. There's no model in place that is going to pay anybody to be part of our program. If if a family has some need, um, we're going to supply some some help, you know, and that's through our grant program. But right now, um, there's there's no nil type thing going on here. Where I, I mean, we're we're really not, you know, if we were making money out of it, I could see where they were coming from. But we're we're just trying to help, and right. so. Um, I don't see a world in which we will be paying people to to come be in our program. You know, we we want to help them. We think it's a it's a win for both sides, um, but mostly it's a win for the kids. Like we want to help make them better, and 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 so if a family needs help, we'll help them. Um, but for the most part, and and we'll be paying expenses. Like when we go on an international trip, they're not reaching into their pocket for anything. But but no, there's no plans for uh, paying. Understood. Well, I think it, that's going to be an we'll interesting. See. Yeah, right. It's it's going to be an interesting one, right? Because all the college, you know, programs with NIL now, it's like so many of these players will make a choice between where do I go. Maybe there's enough time, and it doesn't matter, you know. So I, I think it's a really tough thing to actually even you know, think about right now. But I listen, Chris. What you guys are doing, commend you guys the efforts of what's going, uh, what's happening, what's going to be taking place. So. Kudos to you and congratulations to to the very first uh, you know head coach. So that, Thanks, that's Raj. Awesome. great. Thank stuff. you, Roger. Yeah, and Ryan, thank you. Thanks for yeah. having me on. I appreciate it. No, absolutely. I mean, they got it right. They had to pick a first one, and and there's no doubt that uh, you're the guy for the job. I'm I'm really really excited to to be able to watch and see how you grow this program. The United States absolutely needed it. And uh, I think they got the right captain to the ship. So congratulations. I can't wait to to sit back and watch the, you know, how this all develops. And, yeah. and uh, it'll and be interesting. It'll be interesting. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. But some sleepless nights uh, await for sure. So good luck with that. Happy That's okay. Holiday. That's okay. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Hey, you bet, Chris. Talk to you okay. soon. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. So, wow. Uh, Woo. That That's was, uh, some pretty good stuff there, Ryan. Yeah, um, you know, obviously you and I, 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 I hope it isn't just one through 10 in the rankings because I, I do, I agree with him that if you, if you put one through 10, you're going to have your best bet, but I'm also promising that if you gave me 11 through a hundred, I could get 10 players to beat you. Yeah, which ultimately means you are missing out if you just go one through ten. Yeah, 
I, I and again, I think short order, it's got to go that way. We we understand that. I'm sure uh, we don't like. I don't like it. You don't like it. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who won't like it. But I think at the end of the day, for now, it has to be that way to get it sure. launched. Um, and then hopefully plan for the future on what are you going to do to support growth and not just, you know, picking the best, right? And he is, uh, Chris is obviously passionate about it. I, I don't think the USGA could have, could have done much better than him. I think he will be wonderful in that role. And there yeah. will be growing pains. And we'll talk yeah. to him next year. And he may say, you know what, we've decided that we're not even going to put the rankings into play here. I mean, there will be... There will be trial by error, and five, ten years from now, they'll be in a much better position than they are today. I'm sure he's a little overwhelmed. Yeah, no doubt. And again, think about the USGA saying this is a hundred-year program. I mean, and it's just starting. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of iterations and a lot of learning curves here. So, uh, but I'm glad to see it happen. Uh, to your point, uh, really happy for him. It's a great pick uh, for the U.S. So. I wish you imagine if it. imagine if there was someday a ranking system that also included uh, a predictive formula. I mean, that almost seems to be what everyone is clamoring for. It it's just not out there right now. But an actual where you're scoring January twentieth. There you go, January twentieth. We'll leave that as a cliffhanger because. Uh, oh, did I say that out loud? Whoop. Yeah, that's going to be one of the biggest days in the history of junior golf. And uh, we yeah. look forward to uh, announcing that right here on the Hub of Junior Golf Podcast. Roger, we ran a little long today, but certainly yeah. uh, Coach Zambri was worth every second of it. As always, happy holidays. Happy New Year to you, Roger. Um, this podcast year, keeps Ryan. getting better and better. So on behalf of our producer and director, Michael Nick, the founder of the Junior Golf Hub, Roger Nick, I'm Ryan Burr saying until next time. So long, everyone. This has been the Hub of Junior Golf Podcast. <laughs>